Buenas, buenas tardes. Aquí ya en Puerto Rico son las 12 y 12, uh, although in Texas and in Texas. As we said, well, we're going to start now. We start our time. Uh, 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 and we want to pay you practice on your time to, and, and for the invitation to this first webinar. There's going to be a great uh, so, uh, we'll be doing. Of the you cannot hear hear as well. Okay, can you hear me well now? Better. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We will be recording. We are recording this session for the benefits of the others that couldn't couldn't uh, join us uh, today, and we will be sharing this later to the group. But first of all, I would like. Also, we have President Carlos Morales, who will be introducing our speaker today. from Carlos It's number 10, Miss Nelly and using her, her administrative. Uh, over here uh, as a moderator. So Delixa names is me and his is, is Delixa. Also, oh, I'm breaking up. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me well? Sorry, is the connection here is not that good. Perfect. Uh, we also have Carla Gonzalez from Universidad de Puerto Rico and Michelle from College of Staten Island. Uh, Michael, excuse me. So, and we are supposed to have others who register for the webinar, but we don't doesn't want to uh, to wait uh, to more. Uh, the others that join us will definitely uh, continue the conversation. Uh, as you may know, the speaker of today, uh, she will be presenting the topic, and then at the end we will have a session for questions and 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 answers and then uh, Raimundo who is our our host uh, in Universidad de Rio Grande Valley actually thank you Raimundo for setting this up uh, he will be open all day when you raise your hand he will be open your audio so you can make your question uh, also you can use the chat to make any questions as well if you don't have audio okay so uh, thank you again for being here, and I want to introduce introduce Carlos Morales, who is our vice chair at the Heads Board of Directors, and he's also the lead uh, the leader of this group, and he was the one who helped us identify the speakers for this first webinar. Uh, Carlos, please, uh, he will be introducing uh, the speaker, uh, who is Teddy Mitchell. Go ahead, Carlos. Carlos, we can hear you. Hello. Hey, Raimundo, can you open the microphone for Carlos Morales, please? Yes, you can, you can press on the microphone, Carlos, now. I think Carlos is having technical difficulties. Sorry for this inconvenience. Carlos, can you hear us? 
Carlos Morales. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Oh, okay, then. Uh, all right, no problem. Well, good morning. Uh, as you know, technology, technology is supposed to work. Maybe us users uh, forget something. My name is Carlos Morales, and I am vice chair of uh, the HEADS uh, Consortium. And uh, first of all, good morning and uh, welcome to this um, first, uh, if you will, set of webinars that we will um, be uh, doing for, for the audience of heads. And this morning, <clears throat> we will be doing a session on, a, as you see the title, they are using SIS data to enhance the online learning experience. And, just to give again a little of history and the reasoning behind these uh, webinars is that um, at our September conference call, uh, it was identified that it would be beneficial for uh, members of the audience of heads or the membership actually to um, be acquainted with different uh, um, levels of information, if you will, because uh, there are different stages in which um, <coughs> in which some of our memberships, uh, membership members are in terms of their operations, you know, how uh, sophisticated or how complex they are. Some of them are building operations, while others are uh, a year far ahead and then, you know, may require a, a more, more advanced type of information. So with that said, we have identified a couple of topics, and this is one of the first topics that we are uh, uh, providing a webinar. This morning, uh, as I said, the title is Using SIS Data to Enhance the Online Learning Experience. And the presenter um, is Ms. Cherie Mitchell. And uh, let me just read really quick a, a bio about Cherie. She completed a bachelor's degree in business administration from National University in San Diego. In 2001, she began her career as procurement manager for a large California-based corporation where she was responsible for sourcing products to maintain inventory levels to meet the demand for annual sales of $600 million. After completing her master's degree in management, Sherry relocated to Fort Worth, Texas, where she transitioned from a corporate career to serving in higher education. In 2006, Sherry began her career at Tarrant County College as a distance learning coordinator, where she was responsible for developing and managing the processes for, for a variety of student success initiatives, including the registration assessment for new online students, coordinating proctor exams for online courses, planning uh, the training and certification program for new online instructors, and creating a quantitative matrix to assess the effectiveness of the certification program and quality readiness of new online courses. For the past eight years, Sherry has been the e-learning instructional analyst at Tarrant County College, where she has been responsible for reporting data related to all areas of assessment of the online campus, this is a Connect campus, through which the college serves over 20,000 students each semester through offerings of a, over 150 unique core subjects and more than 800 individual core sections taught by a 400 instructors. So, uh, without further ado, Sherry uh, Mitchell uh, will take it over. Sherry. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Okay, so this morning we're going to talk about how you can use the data from your SIS, your student information system, to enhance the online learning experience. And your SIS, the reason why this is so important is because the SIS contains every piece of information pertaining to each student, faculty member, or other person in the institution. And it pretty much houses all the information that that person enters about themselves, including their location, their demographics, their declaration major, program of study, Academic standing is recorded there. The reasons why um, students don't persist in the class would be in there. 
and most importantly, end of course evaluations, which will give you an idea of exactly what the student thought about the class. So now that's a lot of information. And I think that's one of the reasons why some people get very overwhelmed is because administrators have more student information available to them than ever before. But if you have the data and you don't use it, that may be the same as not having the data at all. So the challenge is to use the data effectively and strategically to ensure the highest level of student success. And there are many data points that can be explored when you're using the information from your SIS. Um, this image that you're looking at here, this is just a short list of all of the information that in your SIS. These are just individual reports of everything that is mentioned um, on a student application. Anytime that they go to interact with the institution on a digital basis, all of the information is recorded here and is readily available for you to use it to make good decisions. So using the information can positively impact all aspects of the student learning experience. And it can also be used to improve the efficiency and communication between administrators and faculty. Now, although some information does not necessarily transfer between your SIS and your learning management system to guide or design curriculum, outside of the LMS, the information can be used to help guide the decisions that are made that can have an impact on what a student will experience within and outside of the LMS. So as I mentioned before, you want to start at the beginning, pay attention to the middle, and the end is not the end. It's really just the beginning to make changes and improve on the next semester. So when I mentioned starting at the beginning, that means with the planning stage. And basically, um, if you're just starting out, use the information that you have from your last semester as your base to start thinking about your offerings as soon as possible because Class doesn't start for the student on the first day of class. It actually starts from the first time that they see that that class is available for them to register in. So think about what your registration window is for students so that they can begin to make good choices pertaining to their degree plans, their program goals, and also it can impact their financial aid restrictions if they're only allowed to take a certain number of classes during a certain period of time, but they wanna maximize the time that they have so that they can finish their program quickly. Um, so by looking at what you did last semester, you can look at how many sessions you offered during the particular semester? What was the time period? Did you have four weeks? Did you have six weeks? Did you have eight weeks? And as you can see on this visual, I don't know, maybe you can't see it as clearly, but here this mentions the number of classes that were offered during a particular session. And it also mentions the seat capacity for each of those classes. So, you can see right here the registration start date, the date that the class starts, the last day to drop, and how many students enrolled in those classes before the class actually started, and how many were enrolled on the census date, and then ultimately how many were enrolled at the end. So one of the main things that you can do in order to identify what you really wanna offer is you can look at how fast are these sessions filling up, um, look at which ones are filling up faster, which ones are filling up slower. Is that an indication of where you need to um, guide your programs and your offerings for future? Um, do you have any anomalies? For instance, if you only had a class that was 95% full, was that on purpose? Are you attempting to have a smaller class size? And if that is true, what was the success rate at the end as far as what students believed um, as far as 
Did they persist? What was their grade in the end? And if that is true, if that anomaly is true and maybe you want to keep your enrollments at only 95%, then is that only applicable to certain sessions? Is it only applicable to the classes that are four weeks that are starting after spring break? Or is it applicable to the classes that start um, during winter break? Or is there something that you're identifying that can be applied universally so that in the next term, you can make those changes to your schedule? Um, so you can also look at popularity of a particular session. For instance, did the March start classes fill up faster or did the term length classes fill up faster? You can also look at preferences for instructors. If you're monitoring how many students registered during the first week, how many students registered during the second week, how many students registered during the third week. Then you can look and see, okay, all of the government sections filled up except for this particular one. Is that because of an instructor issue or is there an instructor preference or is that government class only offered during this time and that wasn't as popular? Then you can think about for the next semester, Maybe you don't want to offer government during that March start because it took a long time to fill. So that might not be where your student demand is. So that's um, part of the foundation setting the planning. That is the first interaction that you have with the student. So pay attention to the middle. So what's going on after registration? Because from the time a student registers for the class until the day that the class actually starts, there are several opportunities to ensure that that student doesn't drop the course, that they're well prepared for the course, what they will expect during the course, and for them to establish a relationship with the instructor. Now, research has suggested that a prepared student is, is a successful student. So that being said, the preparation is going to start well before the first day of class. So what is your student experiencing? Um, are your instructors trained and ready to go? You can look at things like the online experience of an instructor. You can see that um, if there's an instructor that has been teaching online for several years, are those classes for that person filling up faster and are they necessarily the first ones to um, have the interaction with the students that is required. One thing I want to mention, the data is going to be subjective to what your organization requires. Each organization is going to have different um, regulators that establish certain standards that they have to abide by, but there are some um, there are some aspects of the class that are not regulated that are strictly institutional specific to what you want to monitor, and that means that you get to set the standards for your organization, and you get to set the goals. So you want to establish your goals and um, make sure that they're in alignment with compliance standards. So let's say, for instance, ideally, you may want to see that 100% of your most experienced instructors are also the most popular, meaning that their classes are filling up first. Or if it's the opposite, if classes are not filling up first, or if the student evaluations at the end of the course don't indicate that that um, instructor is necessarily um, the best teacher, then maybe um, time can't be used as a factor to identify the best instructors. Maybe um, ideally you want to see that 100% of your instructors are posting their syllabi or other important documents as close to the beginning of registration as possible, but you only have 50% of your instructors. You can see right here, you can use um, your data to monitor, okay, when when was the instructor first um, certified to teach online? When did they start teaching online? How long have they been teaching online? Okay, so once registration started, did that particular instructor have 
their um, ICR and student requirements posted and available to the students? Yes or no. And were the learning materials communicated to the student um, in the textbook adoption stage or were there OERs that were identified that were going to be used for the class instead of the textbook? Was that information communicated to the students and if so, when? And ideally, you want to have all of those important pieces of information communicated to the students as early as possible. So you can use your data to identify, OK, well, there's a particular instructor who might not have done anything to prepare the student for class. And therefore, there might be something that you can look at in the student evaluations for that course or the success rates for that course or the withdrawal rates for that course. And that can ultimately help you plan for what is the plan for that particular instructor or for that particular course. So those are um, little pieces that you can also identify after registration. So, The end technically starts maybe after the first day of class. I mean, we're all working towards the end goal of making sure that our students are successful in the class. So you want to make sure that you keep your students. And if you don't keep them, you kind of want to identify why and ways that you can do something different in the future. So after the last day of classes pass, there are many opportunities to identify ways to enhance the student experience for the next semester. Assessing the success rates of the students who persisted and how effective they believe their instructor was. So your SIS data contains important stuff that you will need to know, such as your withdrawal rates. Um, how many students withdrew? When did they withdraw? Was there a big percentage of withdrawal rates between the time that the first day of class happened or was it bigger between registration in the first day of class or was it bigger between the census date and the last day to drop? Um, response rates to course evaluations. You'll notice on here that there is, even though there were if you look at the classes that filled first during a particular session and you track all the way down to, okay, we're going to assume that this was a popular class and it filled first and students persisted and they finished and the success rate was um, acceptable, then, okay, you want to probably find out what it is that that instructor did that made that class so successful. But if you have a small response rate to your end of course evaluations, then maybe you want to look at ways that you can improve the response rate to those end of course evaluations or identify other ways that you can get feedback from students so that that information can be included here in your um, SIS and then ultimately used to make decisions about um, other uh, areas of the program. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention is there are, um, even though this information is specific to um, performance and how this did and their subjective um, information that they provided in the end of course evaluations, you can also use this information for a variety of things and see if there is a correlation. For example, if you have um, an end of course evaluation for a class that had a pretty high success rate, the withdrawal rate was, um, you know, comparable to other classes and you're looking to find out what you could use as a strategy among other classes or instructors. For one, you can ask that instructor and ask them to participate in the professional development for other instructors that are going to be teaching online, basically sharing their success strategies. Also, you can look at what are the students saying about the class. If they say 
um, I was going to stay in this class, but the price of the textbook didn't warrant um, the length of time that the class was being offered or during the session that it was being offered. Or if they say the instructor, the instructor did not really even use the textbook that we had to pay for. That's all something that um, impacts the student's overall experience. So maybe you want to look at, OK, are there OERs available or other um, learning materials and resources that can be used outside of the textbook so that maybe the experience for the student would be more favorable. Um, you can also look at uh, their, okay, so this slide here shows at the end, if you look at one session as a whole, you can look here to see um, your distribution of faculty as far as full-time or part-time. Do you have a goal for your institution to have only full-time instructors teaching online or only part-time instructors teaching on, online? Or do you have a certain percentage that you want to match? This will help you identify, okay, if you what percentage that you're at so that you can alter that or plan accordingly for the next time. Um, your percentage of um, information that was made available to students prior to the start of class, let's say uh, your goal is to have 95% at least of the instructors have all the information that the students need posted prior to the start of class. And if you can see on here that you're only at 42% of your instructors are doing that, then that might be an area of consideration for you to identify ways that you can, is it a training issue? Maybe you need to um, include a section about the importance of this step in your online training or your professional development sessions or anything that you offer to your faculty. And that's also true for if they are notifying students of the um, learning materials that are required for the class. If you want to have 100% of your instructors that are notifying your students well in advance and you're only at 50%, then there's the opportunity for improvement. Um, also, if you're looking at your success rates and you want to keep your drop rates, let's say you want to keep them to 3% and you can see that you're at 10%, Okay, so then maybe you want to look at your course evaluations or also what's um, in your SISs. They can also capture the reason why a student drops because if a student drops online, then there's usually a field at the bottom for the student to indicate why they're dropping. And so you can use that information to help impact your withdrawal rates. And there's also information for anything that your students will experience, um, not necessarily in the learning management system, but like I said, the experience starts before the first day of class, it actually starts with registration. And so if you can take all of this information that you found during one semester and you can use that repeatedly because it's going to be different every semester. And you can use that to either assess where you're at and if you want to stay at the desired state, then that'll be your goal for making your planning preparation for next semester. Um, if there is a goal that you're trying to reach as far as a percentage of students that persisted or um, were successful, then you can use your data to identify the progress that you're making towards that and then alter those goals um, for the next semester for continuous improvement. So questions? I know I moved through the information a little bit fast, so if you have any specific questions that I can answer, I'd be more than happy to do that at this time. Uh, 
be for for the information um, and any questions or comments or anything that you would like um, Sherry to expand on I, there are a couple of hands being raised Let's see what Yeah, yes. Raimundo will be to the non It's hard to hear. Uh, Raimundo, could you please If you like, you can type the question into the text box and I can read it there. That would be good. Okay, the first question says, how would you know if a faculty member has shared the information with students or communicated after students registered for a course? That is a great question. Um, in, your I, in your SIS, anytime an instructor enters any information into the SIS, then um, that becomes a piece of data that can be used. So in our, at our institution, um, we have a report that runs person that faculty member's name comes can come on a report that says, yes, this instructor has entered this information and shared it with the students for public viewing. So it's actually the opposite of self-reporting because a lot, an instructor can say, yes, I have shared this information with the students. Okay, well, how did you do that? Obviously, if you did, you might have done it outside of the normal process that we have to connect. However, can you please um, enter that information in the digital form that we've allocated? And the communication piece, correct, they do usually, um, your faculty, yes, our faculty usually communicate via Blackboard also. However, it is, it's difficult to measure or report. And that's one of the main reasons why your end of course evaluations are gonna be your most effective we way to you, find Sharon. out. If you did, can you hear me? You, can you hear me? I can. You can, okay. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, there are a lot of things that are difficult to measure inside of Blackboard, but the pieces that are um, okay, the pieces that are outside of the LMS before the actual course content starts taking place, those are the um, pieces that your SIS will identify. So, as far as um, in the end, you'll be able to see if an instructor has a lot of um, responses to the end of course evaluation that says my instructor never responded to emails or my instructor didn't make this clear, then again, it might be a little bit late after the fact, but there is also um, a report that, our, that we have pulled out of our SIS that actually lets us know how often is the instructor logging into Blackboard 
are they only logging into Blackboard every seven days or are they logging in every two days? Whatever your requirement is for your um, institution, then you may be able to um, maybe not necessarily find out everything that the instructor is doing, but every little piece of information can be helpful. Um, Um, uh, the question is, do anything special to increase student completion of course evaluations? And actually, um, we recognize that the response rate is low all over the district, not just for the online classes. That seems to be something that has, um, the response rate seems to have declined dramatically since the appraisals were put online. So as opposed to students having to be taken to a place to fill out the evaluations or um, having class time devoted to filling them out. The response rate has been decreasing ever since that's no longer an option. Um, so uh, us as an, organ as an institution, we have established a course evaluation committee that is exploring some different ways. And one of the last things that we um, are attempting to implement is a process that has um, become very popular among uh, some of our neighboring institutions is where to ensure that the student knows that their responses to the survey or the evaluation will not have an impact on their grade and that they will be completely anonymous, we are looking at the idea of um, having a link to the course evaluation sent to the student along with the notification that their grade is available to view. And all they have to do to view their grade is to um, participate in this little survey. And it's not a withholding of the, of the grade, so there's not any regulation against doing that. There is just a delay of the grade, which um, would be up to the student to decide if they want their grade, if they want to see their grade now or if they want to see it later. Um, we're still working out the logistics as far as how long we will delay them viewing their grade, but at this point um, we're kind of limited on options that we can use that will ensure that the anonymity of the course evaluations um, stays intact, so thank you. Um, the question is, um, a lot of what I mentioned depends on how flexible our system is to make decisions in offering online courses. What type of policies have you established to protect academic freedom from the faculty side and not be perceived as policing them? That is a good question. Um, at this point, the stages that we use to make, um, that we use, our policy basically is our our faculty members have academic freedom. And instead of policing them, we are just keeping track of information. Now, we don't tell instructors that they absolutely have to do something, but as administrators, we can make the decision to decide um, how we staff our classes and what we're gonna be offering. Those types of things we have total control over based on the demand of the student. So as far as what's going on inside the classroom, we try not to use any of this data to impact what we can tell the faculty they can or cannot do. However, we can use this data to improve what we're training our faculty on. Um, our communication to them as far as services that are available to them. And of course, the student evaluations are always available to, to the faculty members. So if we make a change based on information that's in the student evaluations, that's pretty much not disputable because ultimately 
we're here to serve the students and not necessarily um, make sure that we don't hurt the faculty members' feelings. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other typing. So at this point, I'm, I'm gonna assume no more questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, one more question. Um, what units do you collaborate with to ensure success of these initiatives? That is an ex, ex Excellent question. Um, yes, I t our is our SIS um, is the main is basically administered by IT. So if there are any um, reports or any pieces of information that we need to um, identify, we have to first work with the IT department to ask them to um, write the report for us will tell us the information that we need. Um, enrollment management, we work, yes, directly with them. We actually have an academic support um, department that we work with to help us identify our offerings and um, during which sessions they should be offered. And then, of course, um, all of this information is, um, is used by many of the administrative units throughout the district so that we can ensure that we're providing the same types of requirements for um, online faculty as we are for face-to-face -face faculty. Now, I don't see any other question, Sherry. So, uh, in on behalf of HEADS and our member institutions in Puerto Rico and United States, we definitely thank you for your time and sharing your expertise and your experience with that. We truly appreciate it and thank you so much. We will be, as I mentioned before, we record this session, so we'll, we'll be sharing. Uh, this. Okay, thank you so much and have a great afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle.